speakers. One this morning you need to remember in prayer. No requests. What's her name, Michael? Okay, if you'll remember, Crystal, this is a friend of uh, Michael Stillwell's. Her mother was found, had had a stroke. Um, she's in a coma, and they don't think she's going to come out of it. So uh, please remember this uh, dear family in your prayers. No other requests? Yes, sir, Russ? Okay. Please, uh, please remember uh, Bill Wilburn in your prayers and the passing of his wife. As he makes this transition, it's a tough road. Any other requests this morning? If not, Brother Barry, will you lead us? Okay, just a, one more a word about our visitors. We uh, get a chance, make sure you get a chance to meet Doug's sister and her daughter who's with us here today. It's great to have her. And then we have some friends from Lakeland. Um, the Bengals are here from, uh, from Lakeland. And uh, if you were watching the news, you saw there was a tornado in Lakeland. But uh, these are dear friends of ours, uh, Renee and Jeff. We won't ask them to stand. But uh, they're, they're, uh, my dad performed their wedding year that I graduated high school, so about two years ago, and so, uh, uh, just kidding. <clears throat> okay, yeah, and Glenn's mom, great, great to have you with us. Other visitors as well, appreciate you all being with us this morning. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 16, and to bring us up to speed on what's going on here, the uh, one of the take-home messages from, from this chapter is that people are messy. A brethren are messy. An apostle is messy. John Mark is messy. Barnabas is messy. Folks are messy. And uh, church work sometimes can be messy. And we see that in a conflict between uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas over the taking of John Mark on the second missionary tour. Now, the work is set before them, and we've brought out uh, in weeks before that they're not going to divide over this. There's not going to be uh, two divisions or sects that, that result from this. They're going to keep preaching the same gospel, but they're going to go about it in different directions. So it's a take-home message that sometimes we may have different ideas on how the work is to go forward, but what the work is does not change. What the Word of God is does not change. The methods and who goes where, when they go, how they might go, those things may differ uh, according to occasion and, and time. So we see that in, uh, in this as well. And then we roll over, uh, as we looked at last week, and another take-home message, as we looked at Paul, as he would travel north, Barnabas would take off to the south, but Paul would travel north into an area where eventually he'll hear the Macedonian call. So last week when we were together, 
we talked about this journey that Paul uh, would take. He wanted to go and visit the churches that he had first visited when uh, on that first missionary tour, as we refer to it. But he wants to go back and see these churches, and so he does. But instead of staying in that region and proclaiming the gospel, he is forbidden by the Holy Spirit and Christ to to proclaim the word in that area. And so as we study this, one of the take-home messages is that sometimes doors of opportunity close for us. Sometimes uh, a door that we would like to go through, um, it's not opportune, it's not timely, it's not the right time. So God forbids them. God forbids them from proclaiming the gospel in this area. And we know that this area does get the gospel, and it does get the gospel even by the hands of Paul. But on this occasion, in this moment, it's not the right time. All the details and why that is the case, I'm not aware of. But we know that he goes eventually into Troas, and he hears the Macedonian call. He sees this vision of a man saying, come over unto us. When we think about the history of the gospel upon European soil, sometimes we'll say things like, well, this is the first time the gospel was on European soil. But we know from Acts chapter 2 that there were individuals that were as far away as Rome who were there on the day of Pentecost. So this is some time after the day of Pentecost, maybe uh, several decades roughly after the day of Pentecost, where the gospel by Jews who hear and obey on the day of Pentecost, they would go back into uh, into their home regions. There would be synagogues there, and by the scriptures, the Old Testament, They would proclaim that Jesus is risen, according to these prophecies, and they would go back to that. And then the apostles would spread this as well. So we take up in Acts chapter 16, and we're looking at verse 11, and it says, So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. So here Luke, in just a few few words, takes us on this journey up through Neapolis, And eventually they end up there in uh, Philippi, verse 12. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. So Luke doesn't tell us how many, but uh, notice there he says, we remained. Very interesting, a turning point in the book of Acts is these we, us, where Luke is including himself. Um, not only as the narrator and giving the history of what had happened in and among the apostles, but now as, as a participant, we, we remained there. So there's lots of we passages. And from uh, 16 forward, you'll see we passages. So uh, we often think of Paul with Lydia at Philippi, but it's actually Paul, Luke, Silas, all those guys are there. In, uh, in this Philippian uh, aspect of the missionary tour. Big picture here is that the church is greater than any one individual. Even as faithful and as hardworking and as diligent and as intelligent as the Apostle Paul was, this mission is bigger than him. And the work is greater than him. Now, when we look at the history of what's going on here in Acts chapter uh, 16 and following, Just to kind of put some historical tidbits in your mind, roughly 49 AD, Claudius in Rome had expelled Jews from there. Later in this missionary tour, Paul is going to unite with Priscilla and Aquila. Which one was the man? Aquila was, right? So uh, Paul's going to unite with him. Remember what they were by profession? Tent makers. All three of them were, right? Priscilla, Aquila, Paul, they were all tent makers. So uh, Claudius expels the Jews from Rome, so Ro- uh, uh, Jews would, would go in different parts of the Roman Empire. Paul's going to unite with them on this missionary tour. And so this tour is going to be time-wise between about 51 and 54 AD. Uh, we're going to see during this time as well that First and Second Thessalonians are going to be written. Paul's going to go down... He's going to be kind of chased uh, by Jews, if you will, persecuted by Jews. He'll go from Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea. Then he'll go down to Athens. He'll be in the southern uh, realm of, of, uh, of Greece here. So we've got two regions in Greece. We've got Macedonia in the north, Achaia in the south. And uh, he's going to spend about a year and a half in Corinth. 
And scholars think that that's where, where he was spending this year and a half in the south of Corinth, that he writes two letters to the churches in Thessalonica. We can see as Paul would pen these letters, Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, that these are churches that are vibrant. These are churches that are healthy. These are churches that he's encouraging in the gospel. And so uh, he'll spend some time in these various regions. But let's look back at Acts 16 in verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Paul, as his custom was on Sabbath day, being a Jew, knew that the Jews would gather in a synagogue. A synagogue would be a place of worship, a place of teaching as well, kind of like a school slash uh, a place of worship. And But he knows that also that that's not the only place where folks who are uh, who are thinking religiously are found. He goes to a riverside where we suppose there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Verse 14, One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Now, on the map here, you can see where Lydia is from. Paul is forbidden here on this missionary tour from going and proclaiming the gospel. But when he goes over into Philippi, he meets a lady by the name of Lydia. And this is where she's from. She's from the city of Thyatira. She's a seller of purple uh, goods. And he meets her. She's praying down by a river. But then the Bible says this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. There's a lot of discussion on the Holy Spirit these days. A lot of discussion among our own brethren a lot of discussion uh, outside uh, our faith in various uh, circles on how, when, where the Holy Spirit works. There's this notion among individuals who are sometimes very, uh, uh, what's the word, firm in their beliefs on uh, that the only way a person can believe in God is for the Holy Spirit to begin faith in them. That's the belief. The belief out there among some, there's lots of versions of Calvinism, lots of versions and flavors and shadows and stuff. Um, all Calvinists um, don't hold to it the same way. But there's this notion out there that faith begins with the Holy Spirit. And not only does faith begin with the Holy Spirit, but you can't even begin to believe until the Lord opens your heart. So the Lord, Lord begins faith in a person's life. And some Calvinists would say that God has determined that some people will be lost. So what God does is he ignites the faith in the life of a believer. That's what's going on in various religious circles. Now, given Acts chapter 16 and this phrasing here, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. What do you make of that? How, how did the Lord, okay. Yeah, how did the Lord open her heart? What do you think? Okay. Right. Okay. Right? Okay. Yes, yeah, she was a worshiper of God, absolutely. She was seeking him, wasn't she? See? Down by the river praying. Right. 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 So she was baptized as well, Dave. Okay. 
purpose was to respond to the things spoken. Russ? Okay. Yeah, well, there's a lot that goes into some of those things. Um, uh, Michael was talking about a private conversation he's had with a, well, it's kind of public as well. He's had a, a, a public and private conversation with a man who um, is of some of the persuasion that I've talked about. And uh, the other comment that was made was that she was a worshiper of God. Okay. <clears throat> so how did the Lord, how did the Lord open? was that? Okay, opened it so she could understand. Made her heart be ready. Okay, let's look at a 14 for just a moment and look at the first three words. What's the first three words of four, verse 14? One who heard us. How does faith come? It comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So this idea of the Lord, and, and when I say these things, I don't, want, I don't want to deny or I don't want to understate God's role in providence in helping a religious seeker find God. I don't want to understate that. I don't want to take away the way God works uh, in our world um, through individuals, through circumstances, and things like that. I don't want to deny God of his providence. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. But I think it's important in Scripture that we understand we're talking about how the Lord builds churches. And are we going up against a true doctrine when we have religious friends who say that the Holy Spirit is the one who, who opens the heart of a person? Well, the question is, how does the Holy Spirit open the heart of a person? Well, here with Lydia, he's, she's listening to the words of an apostle. She's there with Luke, right? the scriptures, right? Okay. That's right. That's what Romans 10 teaches, right? But, but notice this, Eddie. Brother Eddie points out that the Lord is, is, uh, is working with an individual's willingness. Well, and we see this in, in the Thessalonian, one of the Thessalonian letters. So here's this interaction that, that uh, Lydia has with the Apostle Paul. She's seeking God. She's, uh, she's going after him. She's fine. Her heart is there, right? Now, think about this, because this is a take-home message with this. Is Lydia a religious person? Is Lydia a worshiping person? Is Lydia, it was Paul like, well, you know, um, I don't really want to rock the boat here. I don't, you know, she's a good-hearted woman. I don't want to really, I don't want to rock the boat here. She's religious. She's worshiping. Um, I don't want to be judgmental and bring to her some other stuff, right? Sometimes it's looked at as if you try to teach the necessity of baptism which is exactly what the scriptures teach. People will say, well, you're being judgmental or you're being too harsh or you're being dogmatic or you're a legalist, right? All of these uh, uh, descriptives of folks that, that, uh, that are trying to say, hey, um, let's stick to what this says. Let's stick precisely to what this says. When you read that verse, what do you come up with? And so uh, Paul, Paul had none of those fears, I believe, in his heart at all. He was going to teach her the way of God more perfectly. And so when we see the way that the Lord opens our heart, look, look in Luke 24 with me for just a moment. Yes, sir. Okay. 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 So the comments made that, that, uh, that the audience was broader than Lydia. Uh, it was a group of women who were down by the river, right? So, uh, uh, very uh, good point. Luke, uh, look at Luke 24 with me for just a moment. 
here's Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Uh, after the resurrection, he appears on the road uh, to Emmaus with a, a man by the name of Cleopas and one who's unnamed. Now look in Luke 24, verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? It's the risen Jesus. It's the one who fulfilled those scriptures. It's him who's with those two folks on the road to Emmaus. And he's going to the Old Testament, the scriptures, to show these men on the road to them. And so I want you to see and underline in your Bible, while he opened to us, Jesus opened to us on the road to Emmaus. How did he do it? He did it with the word of God. Even though he was the risen Messiah, firsthand experience there. He could have said, yeah, I'm, I'm the one that Jerusalem's going crazy about, right? Now. I'm that guy. Well, if you keep moving forward in Luke chapter 24, skip down to 32, and notice this. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? How does the Lord open the heart? Well, earlier in Luke chapter 24, the risen Jesus talks about that in that uh, he opened to us the scriptures. The heart is primed by the hearing of faith comes by hearing. Post-resurrection, faith comes by hearing. Not only the word, the word was confirmed by signs, miracles, and wonders prior to the death and resurrection of Christ, with the death and resurrection of Christ, and after the resurrection of Christ, confirmed by signs, miracles, and wonders. But we have to see here that the priming of the heart comes by the hearing of the word of God. Why is evangelism so important? Why is the spreading of, of Christianity so significant? It, well, it happens by the hearing of the word of God and the heart being primed. And so I want us to see in verse 32, while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. So it is the scriptures that are priming the heart. And, we're, and when we say that, we're not undermining providence. We're not undermining a heart that's seeking God. We're not taking anything away from that. But what we're saying is that of all the methods that God could choose of getting to man, he chooses a spoken and written word, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Right. So when we talk about the calling of God, Dave brings out a good point. How does God call upon man? But what is the means by which God calls upon man? 2 Thessalonians 2.14, he calls us through the word, through the gospel. And so uh, this is what scripture teaches. And we can look at various uh, instances of that. When we look at the Ethiopian eunuch and we see uh, him. It's the angel of the Lord slash Holy Spirit that moves Philip to a heart that's what? Reading the book of Isaiah. What do these things mean? Who's he talking about? That's the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, Philip, through the Holy Spirit, moves to him, but then Philip preaches the word, you know, and, and here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? They both went down into the water, Acts chapter 8. They both came up out of the water. Started at the same scripture and, and, re, and uh, was reading and preaching uh, to them. So, Here's some uh, uh, important truths that, that we can see, various case studies we can see. Um, God through Ananias, the Lord had even appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road. He had seen the Lord, right? And it's Ananias who tells Saul what he must do to be saved. Go into the city, he'll be told you what you're going to do. Saul's blind, he's fasting, all this is going on. But it's the, it's the faith comes by hearing. Even one who was commissioned to, to be his apostle, it's the preaching of the word of God. Now, why is this so significant? Why do I keep emphasizing it? Because we have to see in the mind of God that there's kind of, there is a, a level playing field that all who will be saved will be saved by the gospel. All who will be saved will be saved by the gospel. 
And we can see it in case study after uh, case study. David brings out on the, in the case of Ananias how Ananias was uh, um, was told to go to the city, but he wasn't. Uh, but but Saul wasn't saved yet. He was told he was preached the gospel by Ananias. Ananias, a messenger of God, was sent to him. He was told that what he must do. Now Acts twenty two sixteen, arise, Paul or Saul, arise, Saul, and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You want to be saved, you want to be forgiven, you want to be right in God's eyes. Do what Saul did. Rise and be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So, uh, as it's stated, it's very clear. Now look at 2 Corinthians 4 with me for one moment, then we'll jump back in Acts 16. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. I want you to see in Paul's letter here a statement It's made uh, by the apostle. And he's talking about his ministry uh, or the ministry of the apostles. And he says, I am not aware, 2 Corinthians 4, i got to get the right place here. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, talking about the gospel. And, if, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. What's he saying? He's saying that Veil has to do with something covering over, right? A woman's veil would cover her eyes. You wouldn't be able to see her full glory and beauty of her face because of a veil. The gospel veils. How does the gospel veil, Paul? What do you mean by all that? And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. Here's the veil that comes over the unbeliever's face so that they won't see, that they refuse to see. Why? Their fathers are different, right? It's the father of this world versus God our father. Their fathers are different. They're, they're, uh, they're not children of the same uh, uh, individual, if you will. And there's a veil there. What, what's that veil, Paul? Well, the veil is, the veil is this unbelief that comes that keeps them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves, as your servants for Jesus' sake. So I want you to see in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, that the same gospel that opens hearts, the same gospel, one gospel, right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. The same gospel that opens hearts, right? To some, they respond with veils over, blinded, different fatherhoods, unbelief, it's cloudy. It's not a different gospel. It's one gospel. Why is it? Now, here's two different responses to the one gospel. One, look at it with the veil. Are we going to see? And so how do we take this veil off so that we can see clearly? In Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus talks about parables, uh, it talks to them and why he speaks to them in parables. He says in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 14, that their heart has grown dull. With their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn. So there's this connection between the heart and the mind and the eyes. The heart may, may blind the eyes. The heart may dull the ears. The heart may result in a veil that stands up. I can't, you know, um, you present evidence after evidence after evidence that the gospel is true, that Jesus is risen, that all these facts in the, in the New Testament are accurate. We can believe them. We can have confidence in them. We can act on them. Why is it that some people won't believe? Because their heart refuses to. Until the veil comes off. 
and the heart connects and sees the gospel in all of its glory. It's one gospel. It's one faith. It's one uh, body of evidence that we have here. So uh, look back now at Acts chapter 16 with me. Verse 15. Well, actually, uh, yeah, verse, verse 15. So the Lord, the Lord opened her heart. How he opened her heart is through the hearing of the word. Now, you could underline that in the first three words of verse 14 of Acts 16. One who heard us, faith comes by hearing. Verse 15, what did she hear? Well, Luke doesn't detail the whole uh, spiel, if you will, of everything that was said to her by or to the group by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So what's essential in this, or what's necessary that we see in this, is, yes, the gospel in a heart that's seeking God will, will yield itself and follow the will of the word. That's precisely what happens here. And so we don't, uh, in a balanced view of seeing how God works and uh, spreads the gospel in our community, it's through this religious seek first the kingdom of God, right? So here's a heart that's, that's passionately pursuing that. And, uh, and that's who, who Lydia is. And, uh, and after she was baptized, and her household as well, and so we see the, the, the urgency, we see the necessity, we see her compliance with not only what faith was all about. There was nothing that Paul had to apologize. He wasn't uh, rocking her, her boat. It was just like when uh, uh, Priscilla and Aquila took Apollos aside, taught him the way of the Lord more perfectly. Right? Here was a, a very passionate um, Jewish preacher. Paulus was. Very convict, very eloquent man, Paulus was. But Priscilla and Aquila take him aside and say, hey, um, there's some stuff you need to know. No shame in that, right? And when we care enough to tell, when we care enough to speak, when we care enough to say, hey, um, maybe you've never heard this. Can I share with you something? Would you mind, would you mind us spending some time and me sharing with you some things that you may have never heard before. And, and that, that you care enough to say something. And both, uh, you know, you and your friend at work, you may live very uh, moral lives in ma very many ways. But these differences between all of these churches, do they matter to God? Did, did the difference between Judaism and Christianity matter? It, it mattered in Lydia's case, right? It mattered in Apollos' case. It, it mattered in the Ethiopian eunuch's case, right? Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Great point. The point was made out that these differences do matter, and uh, and we we should care if it if it matters to the Lord, it should matter uh, to us. Now I want you to see something else here, and we we hinted at it already. This is a take home message from our text this morning in Acts chapter sixteen, and you see in these uh, beginning in verse eleven, you could circle in your Bibles all the time so you see the word we, us. Um, either of those uh, second person plural pronouns, I think they are in English. Is that right, Dave? Am I, is my grammar on this morning? Um, is that right? We is first. Oh, sorry, first. Okay, my grammar's not on this morning. So first person plural, we, us. Okay. Um, first person plural, we are us. So you see all those instances in the text. Well, why does that matter? It's because Luke is writing this letter to Theophilus, and he's, he's, he's telling you, I was there. We. He was at Philippi. He was on the second missionary journey. But it wasn't just Luke alone, or Luke with Paul. It was Luke with Paul with Silas, with Timothy. Remember, Timothy had been brought on board 
at this point in Luke in, in Acts chapter 16. Um, the Philippian uh, Lydia now and her household. We're in Macedonia. We're in this northern area of Greece. And I want you to see how much more than Paul was going on in these churches. Not only do you have Philippi, but in the days ahead, you'll have Thessalonica. In the days ahead, you'll have Berea. You'll have all of these different servants of God serving in different ways. In a few moments, if, uh, well, probably not this morning, but if you kept reading, you would have a Philippian jailer in his household in Philippi. So here is a region, Philippian jailer and Lydia in her household, two individuals who are contributing to the work of the Lord in this uh, location. I want you to see that in the book of Acts, it's bigger than Paul. It's bigger than his life. This class is called the Evangelistic Insights into the Life of Paul. We're looking at how God strengthens and stabilizes churches. How God strengthens and stabilizes churches is in delegation. It's in delegation of responsibilities. It's in a distribution of a network of workers. That's how the church grows. That's how the church grows. One living a stone at a time, as Peter would talk about. And we see that there's co-workers here. We see that there's there's a, a important homes. Now Lydia is prevailing upon Paul. Hey, you come and stay with us. Undoubtedly, if she was a seller of purple, she was a lady of some means. So she prevails upon, hey, I'm going to take care of you while you're here. Will you let me? That's kind of what she's saying to them. So we see that, that now the work of the Lord is... is, is broadening its reaches in these various communities. She's grateful. She's thankful for the message that the messengers have brought to her. So we see uh, lots of co-workers in the book of uh, Philippians. You see Euodia, you see Syntyche, uh, you see uh, Clement, you see co-workers there. Again, we're in the northern part of Greece. We're in that Philippian city. So Paul would write in this Philippian letter later in his life, commending their work and their efforts. And so I want you to see how, how broad uh, the work is and how it happens. It happens in moments where a diligent servant of Christ says, I know this is where religious people are. I'm going to seek them out. I'm going to see if they're willing to give me ear. That's what's going to go first to the Jew, then to the Greek, right? Perhaps Lydia was a proselyte, a Jewish proselyte. She's praying. She's seeking God. We're not sure specifically if she was. We know that the church in Philippi is blessed uh, by her presence. Let's look in 16 in the couple minutes we have left. Acts 16, 16. And we'll leave on this note. This is the, the case of a, of a young lady who is uh, being taken advantage of. And... Uh, young slave girl who's being taken advantage of. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. There's a fortune teller in, in Warner Robins, right? I think card, tarot card reader or something. Not right down on Watson, maybe. Somewhere around here. I remember seeing that. Um, so here's the slave girl who's very profitable to her masters, by fortune telling. She followed Paul uh, and us, crying, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. You know, is she saying the truth? Is she teaching the truth? Is that true? Was Paul teaching the way of salvation? So then we ask the question, if she's telling the truth, look at Paul's response. And this she kept doing for many days. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Grieved the spirit. Okay. okay. Instead of greatly annoyed, it says grieved. Okay. Troubling Paul. You know, here's this... this uh, girl who is profitable to her owners. Now, here's, here's what happens here. We'll, we'll leave on this point this morning. Paul turns and he casts out this evil spirit. And in turn, and in so doing, he touches the pocketbooks of some folks. 
faith, right, the gospel, is going to confront how we make our living. The gospel will confront how other people make their living. Now, Paul and Silas are going to be in trouble, if you will, because they've taken the gospel and, in turn, it's touched the pocketbooks of some folks. Man, in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. Why do you suppose, well, we don't really have time to chase it this morning. Um, just leave you with this. Character, the characters that bring forth the gospel matter. The heart, the disposition, the love, intellect, the mind, body, soul, the character of a person matters. It's true she was telling the truth, but it's the, 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 it's, it was coming from a person who was knew the truth in part, proclaimed the truth in part, but her deeds were corrupt, right? So was it her fault that, the, uh, that she was um, involved in divination? Question. Right. It was at odds with the will of God. And at the end of the day, uh, this idea of fortune telling and divination, as is uh, explained there. Let's end with a word of prayer. Appreciate your thoughts and, and uh, engaging comments this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord.